Welcome to the Washington Week webcast extra. I'm joined around the table by Dan Balls of the Washington Post, John Harwood of CNBC and the New York Times, Indira Lakshmanan of Bloomberg News, and Jeff Zeleny of ABC News. Jeff was in Des Moines, Iowa this week, if you can believe that, and Dan was in New Hampshire, because it's never too late to find out what all these people are up to. Is it true? Is 2016 looming? Don't we hope so? No! Yeah, it, was so, it, was, it was my first trip back we to do Iowa. Not. It's good, no. Um, Sure, it's looming in the, you know, out in the off stage, I guess, in the uh, off Broadway uh, sort of production. But this is how it always happens. But I was out in Iowa to see Governor Rick Perry, his first visit back to Iowa, sort of testing the waters a little bit. Um, you know, who knows how all these things go. But people are looking ahead to, especially in the, on the Republican side, looking ahead to, you know, who is thinking about this, uh, what's going on out there. But I'll tell you one, th uh, one group of people who are not interested so far are voters. I, mean, I could not find a voter who was even slightly engaged New in this Hampshire? yet. I, so I think that's, I think Jeff's right. I mean, voters are not thinking about this at this point. So who is? Oh, although I should say, I think some Democrats uh, are really hungering for Hillary Clinton. I mean, that, that's, that's a real phenomenon. Um, I, I was up in New Hampshire for 24 hours and talked to some Republican strategist types. They were struck by the fact that while some, some of the candidates have come up there, uh, there's really no serious activity. There's no candidate who's kind of making real overtures kind of under the radar to, you know, start to do things. So, um, in fact, they were a little surprised that there hasn't been more of this, particularly on the, on the Republican side. So is it fair to say that you guys can go to New Hampshire and, and Iowa right now so we don't have to? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and both states have interesting Senate races. I mean, people are looking at that uh, first because that is the game next year, the control of the Senate. I mean, we're going to see that come into much sharper focus, uh, you know, um, right now. That's a real story. I want to t pick up a little bit more, you guys, on where we left off, John, on the, on the politics of this health care fight, because it seems like one of the fears that, one of the problems that the, the White House has in trying to push this one through, this rock uphill, is that there's a generalized fear of creeping entitlement. People remember what happened the last time an ent any ent entitlement was enacted, which was, it, it got good to people. And they said, well, that's, you know, that's not so bad. So the key, the, the key is to try to knock it out, out of the gate. The uh, entitlement programs, their history is that they, once they get started, they tend to become embedded in American life and they grow. They, benefits expand, more people get brought in. Uh, and this really gets to the underlying fear of Republicans and conservatives that we're undertaking another entitlement that we're not going to be able to afford in the long term. Now, the administration has an argument for that. They say that they, uh, established funding that actually reduces the deficit for this entitlement and it is a different mood in the country so it is not uh, I, I don't think you could objectively look at the situation and say this is as likely to experience the expansions that happened in the early years of Social Security for example uh, but it's a danger and uh, it, it is especially a perilous moment when you combine that political fear with the practical problems associated with the disruption of the individual insurance market and the fact that the technology and the public management of the program simply hasn't been affected. I want, I want, I'm curious also how much of an overhang or overlay in all of this dispute over the health care um, debate this week has been about the, loom, the looming, I hate that word, <laughs> the coming midterm elections and that people, both Republicans, Democrats, president, or presidents, second term presidents at midterm don't have a good history are all worried about this. Well, thinking? Democrats should be worried about this. I mean, and um, the president often says, I'm not on the ballot anymore. You know, you don't have to worry about me, et cetera, right. et cetera. Um, but there is, there is clearly a linkage between presidential approval rating and how well the president's party does in midterm elections. That's why we saw him apologize this week. That's, to that's why we did. And, and that's why um, it's important not just for him and his second term agenda to get his own political standing back up. It's important to his entire party in 2014. And there are six seats. Republicans need to win six seats to take control of the Senate. Um, they were, almost did it a couple times before, but they failed because of their own uh, candidates. We're seeing a whole different thing this time. We are seeing Republican leaders, Republican es establishment people across the board getting engaged in primary fights right now. It used to be sort of taboo to do that. Oh, we'll let them work it out. We don't want to elevate these opponents. That's not the case now. We're seeing heavy involvement in primary campaigns. Who knows if it will work? I mean, all these things are, you know, a, a lot of primaries out there from, you know, 
uh, Lamar Alexander in Tennessee to Thad Cochran in Mississippi, et cetera. But six seats Republicans need to win. Not easy, but certainly not impossible. That's why these Democrats, that's why we saw Senator Mary Lander out there um, so intense on this. Uh, senators across the board. You can see who's running for, who's up for re-election fights just by looking at the sponsors of some of these <laughs> fixed Obamacare bills. Like that is kind of a clue to your 2014 map. I'm a great believer in the interconnectedness of all stories. So let me take you to one, Indira, which I think is interconnected. We talked in the regular program about Iran and the negotiations over the nuclear program. That will drive what happens with the Israeli-Palestinian peace talks, which John Kerry has also set great store by, which can't happen if one of the parties at those peace talks are really happy, unhappy about what's going on in Geneva. Absolutely. Am I right? You, know, you, you are right. Um, sad but true, because, you know, as we heard the Israelis say, one of, you know, some leaders have already come out and said John Kerry cannot be trusted. Wow. If they feel he can't be trusted on Iran and on the nuclear issue, then it means they're already discounting him, crossing him off the list as an honest broker on the Israeli-Palestinian issue. And that's a problem. I mean, John Kerry has a lot of weight on his shoulders, and he's trying to solve three problems in one. He's trying to solve the Israeli-Palestinian issue, he wants to solve the Iranian nuclear crisis, and he wants to solve, bring an end to the Syrian war. And they're all interconnected in their way. And, you know, doing one would give him momentum and a bit of a domino effect. It would help him with the others. But it's true that Israel is so doubtful and dubious of Iran's sincerity and willingness to actually keep up its end of the bargain that in trying to undermine John Kerry and the administration on what they think is a bad first step deal towards a comprehensive deal, they're also, in a way, undermining his ability to get Mideast peace. Interconnected. I'm here to tell you all Energy. these things have something to do with one another. Thank you all very much. If you can't get enough, check out my take at pbs.org slash Washington Week, in which I weigh in on the fine Washington art of kicking the can down the road. And we'll see you the next time on the Washington Week Webcast Extra.